Welcome back to another session at LCA. We now have on stage Brendan Gregg, who is a senior performance architect at Netflix, and he's speaking at his first LCA, and he's going to tell us all about BPF. Let's make him welcome. Thank you, and it's a privilege to be here at my first LCA talking about enhanced BPF. Superpowers have finally come to Linux, and the question is now, what do we do with them? I work at Netflix. It's an awesome place to work. We're based in Los Gatos, California, and we're deployed on Linux on the cloud and FreeBSD on our CDN. And there's a number of teams at Netflix who are now looking at using BPF for different projects. BPF is pretty new. Some of the features uh, were only introduced in the last few kernels, so up to uh, 4.9. So it's exciting to see teams so willing to get on board and try it out. What is BPF? BPF originated decades ago as a technology to optimize packet filtering. So if you run TCP dump and you type in some expression like this, it is compiled into the kernel and executed by a virtual machine so that it's efficient. Tracing packets can have very high overhead, tracing send receive. And so if we want to filter based on something, we want that to be as efficient as possible and only pass to user level what we need to. If you run TCP dump with a minus D, it prints out some assembly and that's BPF. So that's where BPF comes from, it's Berkeley Packet Filter. But what's really interesting about this is it's an in-kernel sandboxed virtual machine. And the instructions that we send it are defined in user level. So I can author a program in user space and send it to the kernel and have it do stuff. That's pretty interesting. It's also pretty interesting that it's sandboxed and it's production safe. So think about it this way. If you're a software vendor and you'd like to sell a product to Netflix and say, please run this instrumentation on all your instances or a security product, and you need to do some kernel things, the standard practice is to write a kernel loadable module. It's a common way to do that. That's not exactly sandboxed. And I'd be worried about running a third party kernel module on our systems, on every single system. It's, it's a risk that you have to analyze and understand. BPF changes the game. With BPF, if you gave me a BPF program that achieved the same thing, I know it's running in a sandboxed virtual machine. It's much safer to run. And that's what enhanced BPF is about. They, these are enhancements so that BPF can attach to much more than just send receive packets. We can now attach to kernel dynamic tracing, user dynamic tracing, and trace points. And BPF has been extended to do many more actions, so that instead of simply accepting or rejecting packets, we can modify the state of the system. We can summarize information and create observability tools. And so there are different use cases. The enhancements to BPF be begun with a company called PlumGrid, who were making a software-defined network product. BPF can also be used once, once you can define your network control in software in the BPF program. BPF can also be used for DDoS mitigation to do fast packet drop. And it can be used for intrusion detection as I can instrument various interesting things and alert on suspicious activity. Container security. And what I'm focusing on is observability. Since it can be used for so many different things, it is a very strange thing to discuss and to get our heads around and what might help is to start with a demo so that you can see some of it in action. And I'll demo the observability part, which is what I've been focusing on. And as I'm doing this, I'll explain why BPF has made a difference. So I'm logged into a machine. This, this is just a VBox machine. And I'll demonstrate some tools I wrote with BPF. These are open source tools. They're in the BCC GitHub repository. So execsnoop traces which commands are executed on that machine. Now, I just logged in from another terminal window, and I can see everything that was run, date, ls, 
No, ls is actually alias to uh, ls dash dash color equals auto. So that's interesting. I can see system-wide information about that exact system call and what commands and arguments were run. It's actually a very simple program, but it's useful for debugging short-lived processes, which can sometimes be a performance issue. And also debugging things like software builds. I can see what's going on. I can see that when I logged in, we ran all this stuff. So there's EDC update MOTD.D. In fact, it was failing to run them because it was trying probably walking the path. Then it fa finally ran it. That's running uname and so on and so on. So you can discover a lot about how the system's operating. Another favorite of mine for discovery is OpenSnoop. And OpenSnoop traces the files that were opened with the open system call. Great for identifying where log files are, where configuration files are, where libraries are. Just a debugging tool for understanding when things are going wrong. It can also be useful for performance. Now, those are great, but we can actually do them with an older kernel technology called ftrace. Has anyone used ftrace? Hooray, that's, that's the most percentage I've ever seen at a conference. We have like 25 or 30 percent of people have used ftrace. So I've written these tools in ftrace before and put them on GitHub, my perf tools collection. But there are some things ftrace can't do, and that's, that's where BPS, BPF is filling in the gaps, like biosnoop. Let's try this. So I'm going to drop my caches and create a little bit of a disk workload. OK, a lot of stuff happened. So now what I'm doing is instrumenting the block I.O. events. And I'm recording a timestamp when disk I.O. is issued. And when disk I.O. completes, I can then calculate the delta and print out a line of information. You can do this in ftrace, but you have to emit both the issuing and the completion events to user level for post-processing. With BPF, I can calculate that delta in kernel, and so I'm only emitting the summary. So it's efficient. I'm able to emit half as many events to user level. I can also take that a bit further. So I put them in my path. So now instead of emitting event by event, I've created a custom in-kernel histogram for looking at block I.O. latency. What's passed from kernel to user level is just the count column, so just an array. And that's incremented in kernel by, by a BPF program. You, you can look at this and you can think this is interesting, it's really efficient, and it should also be the basis for performance monitoring GUIs and applications going forward. At Netflix, we have thousands and thousands of instances, and it's, it's fairly impractical to SSH onto them all the time. We have some very good cloud monitoring tools. And so while I'm demonstrating the cap capabilities here at the command line, practically we're going to be using them from a GUI, a GUI that can instrument many systems on the cloud. So that's great. We can do some more summaries. and. Because it's so efficient and so cheap, these can now be a standard part of an application performance monitoring tool. And also, if a third-party vendor said, we want you to run our agent, it's awesome, it's going to do some performance monitoring on your systems, that's not a kernel module, that's a BPF program that's sandboxed, and I'm much more likely to say yes. I can actually be a bit smarter than this. Looking at the disk I.O. information is good for workload characterization of disk performance. But with kernel dynamic tracing, I can go up stack. So another favorite tool of mine is ext4 slower, where I'm looking at the ext 4 file system, and I'm filtering. I'm not only measuring the latency of events, but I'm also filtering so it only outputs if it's slower than some threshold of interest. So these are my ext4 events slower than one millisecond. This is much more useful for analyzing disk I.O. than going at the block device layer as this is closer to the application experiencing pain. The kernel makes all these efforts to have block I.O. be asynchronous to the application. So if you see high block I.O., well, that could be uh, FS flush doing things asynchronously. It could be read ahead doing things asynchronously. There's no reason the application is hurt by what you see in I.O. stat. It might be, but you're not sure. 
by going up an instrument in closer to the application and closer to where it's making file system calls, you can have much more useful information. This, in fact, not just covers the disk I.O. latency, but anything in the file system. So this could be a, a file system lock latency. And I've worked on those type of bugs in the past. And I can summarize it too. I can do xt4 dist. And so that's giving me the distribution by type of operation. And I can see quickly there's a bimodal distribution for opens and multiple modes for reads. There's many of these single purpose tools already available for BPF. And if you install BCC, which is a collection of these tools on your system, they get put under user share BCC tools. I, I wrote many of these. I like to write specific single purpose tools, similar to the Unix philosophy of doing one thing and doing it well. Uh, another one I want to demonstrate, since I just did some kernel tracing, is an example of user level tracing. So bash read line. And that's instrumenting the bash binary system wide and looking at commands people are typing into bash into all the different sessions. Even if the command never succeeded if I typed foo. Uh, that's just an example that we can go into user space with these tools as well. Which means at Netflix we have a lot of Java and we have a little bit of Node.js and a little bit of other things. There's all sorts of interesting things we can instrument in the user level libraries and runtimes. Now, those are the examples of canned straightforward tools. To show something a bit more complicated, I'm going to create a workload of ICMP. There are some tools that are more like multi tools. So they don't do one specific thing. They can do a number of, they can be used in a number of different ways. One of them is func count, which will count kernel functions that match an expression. That's interesting. Turns out ftrace can do this already. With BPF, it means we have some more logic we can apply, but so I've got my, I'm doing a ping of localhost as a workload, and I can see the functions it's calling. Let's pick on one of these, func latency of icmp outcount. And now that's doing the in-kernel summary as a histogram of function latency. That's starting to get really interesting. That's something ftrace couldn't do. There's certainly many times when you be, might be looking at a kernel function that's called very frequently, and it's prohibitive to ftrace or perf events information out for post-processing. And so now I can do those summaries in kernel. But I can do a lot more too. So here's a tool. This one's not written by me. This is written by Sasha Goldstein another BCC contributor. And it is a multi-tool that can do many things. I can trace that that function was called. In fact, I'll show you the function. Here it is in the kernel source. So I simply out count. The first argument is a struct net, and the second argument is a type. With this tool, I can then say, print out the second argument, which was the type. I can decorate that. Nice, so we can do some exploration of the kernel. Func count to find out what functions are being called. And then I can run trace and I can start to examine the arguments to the functions. I can also do things like look at the timing in detail. I can look at the stack traces. Here's the kernel stack trace. So really useful tool for investigating not just kernel code, but user level code as well. Being able to discover the functions and then look at the arguments, look at the stack traces. How do we get there? Type 8, I believe, is ICMP echo request. Uh, there's a table of these. Yeah, these ones. I'm using C scope for a source code browsing. Uh, ICMP echo for is type eight and then zero is the echo reply, which is why we're seeing the eight and then the zero. The stack trace to eight is pretty straightforward. We're doing a send and we're, we're emitting that. The stack trace for zero is more complicated because I'm doing it over localhost. And so you can see doing the send and then if the stack trace bounces back and now we're doing the receive and we've received that echo reply. Pretty interesting. <laughs> 
That's a very simple argument. And that was ICMP outcount. Just for completion, I want to show something a bit more complicated, the net argument, struct net. We can instrument that as well, but I'll show you how it works at the moment. This has worked since this morning, since uh, I was talking to Sasha and said, I really like to do the drill downs using trace, and so he coded it up. Here we go. So I can say, we want the type, I want to pick something from struct net as well. And so here's our struct net. I can pick on something like if index, which is a simple int. And now I can use the names because I've declared them. I don't that stuff. I actually need to tell it where the header is, which is net namespace. This has only worked since this morning, being able to go, go and arbitrary walk around things and pull it, dereference things on the fly. You might be looking at this and saying, oh, but I can already do that. I've got system tap or I've got a way to do it with perf. Well, system tap's not in the kernel and BPF is, and BPF has been designed to be production safe. Also, here I'm not using kernel debug info. Kernel debug info knows where all this information is, but to install it on the instances we have at Netflix, it can, consumes hundreds of megabytes. And so it's pretty cool that we can get this sort of information out without needing that. Although over time we might make it easy and teach B BCC and BPF how to get this stuff automatically. But it's an interesting milestone. And one last demo on this space is another tool that Sasha wrote, ArcDisk, which is very similar. Don't need that. ArcDisk does a summary of the argument you provide in kernel. And so this, we're back to it being very efficient. And so every second it's printing out, these were the calls to that function. You can imagine doing this on a function that, that's called a million times a second. We're using trace and just dumping every event is prohibitive, but I can summarize it in kernel and let it dump it out that way. And again, these tools, it's not just kernel, it's also user level as well. So a lot of the, if you do minus H for the help messages, there'll be examples of going into libraries and going into user space. So that was a short demo on some of the things BPF now lets us do. It lets us instrument all sorts of things for observability attached to kernel functions arbitrarily, attached to user level functions arbitrarily, summarize data or print out per event data, walk into arguments, pull out stack traces, and this is why I've been creating so many tools. Some of the other use cases of BPF, to summarize them briefly, there is Express Data Path, which was developed uh, largely by Brendan Blanco and integrated in Linux 4.8. Express Data Path, you can have a BPF program that can forward packets very efficiently, instrumenting low down in the kernel, close to the device itself. You can also do fast drop, which is used for DDoS mitigation, so that that doesn't consume cycles going into the TCP IP stack. Or then maybe there is something you want to receive and you can pass it over to, to the TCP IP stack. And there's also, you can have more control of, over this. You might redirect things to different CPUs for cache affinity. But it's programmatic, and so you can change the program on the fly and decide how to do the, those redirections. There's intrusion detection, and that's where all sorts of interesting events can be tracked by BPF and then audited. And this can be running 24 by 7. There are some intrusion detection solutions out there that work by tracing send receive at the packet level. As a performance engineer, that makes me shudder because the overhead is quite high. There's also some intrusion detection solutions that work by instrumenting all system calls. Again, I get quite nervous about that because of the overhead. This is this I find much more exciting, where we can put our finger on just the points of interest that are low overhead and instrument those. Only instrument privilege escalation, and when they're using Linux capabilities, or the low-frequency TCP and UDP events, like session establishment or TCP set state, uh, 
instead of send receive. And so you can come up with a great intrusion detection system that way. Container security and, and networking. There's a project, Cilium, that's working on that so that containers can be connected to each other through a BPF program. And then you can implement security policies for enforcement. And then observability, which is what I'm, I've been focusing on. And it can instrument sources, not just static trace points, but also the dynamic tracing, K probes and U probes, which have been in the kernel for a while now. Now I get excited about dynamic tracing because it allows us to do so much. And previously, metrics, as a performance engineer, metrics were vendor chosen and closed sourced and incomplete. There was this art of reading the tea leaves as a performance engineer where you would take the output of VMstat or IOStat or PS and you could figure out what was not said by interpreting what the kernel was doing based on these secondary metrics. And some of these tools haven't changed in a long time. This output of PSALX is, I, I think I took that from Unix 7th edition, running it in an emulator, which looks very similar to what we've got today. But we got good at it, and that was how things were. You wanted to know what the kernel was doing inside, sometimes you had to, had to just infer it based on the system statistics. Dynamic tracing is our crystal ball observability. observability. Has anyone used dynamic tracing yet? So we have a number of people. There's lots of different products for, for using dynamic tracing nowadays. And in the kernel, the infrastructure is uprobes and kprobes. Kprobes has been there for a long time now. Yeah, uprobes is more recent, uh, but still it's, at, at this point it's much more mature for instrumenting everything. I've also on this diagram, I've shown the other event sources. So there are static trace points, which are preferable because they're an API that doesn't change. And when I write a tool, I know it will work on Linux 4.10 and 4.11 or 4.12. So I try to use static trace points first, but if they fail, dynamic tracing lets me fill in the gaps and answer any observability question. I've talked about this before, but event tracing efficiency is another big reason I'm excited about BPF and we're using BPF. Previously, there are tools based on packet capture, which involve taking send receive, buffering it, dumping it out to the file system, dumping it out to disks, and then post-processing it, things like Wireshark or Ethereal or, or many other products. And it, they have been optimized to a fair degree. So they're using ring buffers to pass data from kernel to user. But it's much more efficient. If, I, if I'm doing this just because I care about TCP retransmits, to put my finger on that kernel function and say, just trace that and just give me whatever it is, the stack trace, the arguments. So now we're writing these new CLI tools and I demonstrated many of them. But practically, we'll really be using them from GUIs, especially in cloud environments when there's thousands and thousands of instances. Uh, this, is a, this is, now it feels like an old example that's part of the Linux source, Linux 4.0, a latency heat map of disk IO. I pioneered latency heat maps for system analysis a while ago, and Alexei Storytoyov, the lead developer of BPF, coded this example in the Linux source, which is really cool, and it's using ASCII. So you can quickly see not just, think of a, if you haven't seen these latency heat maps before, it's a histogram over time. So I can not just identify multimodal distributions and outliers, I can also see how that's changing over time. And at Netflix, we will, we're intending people to use it through self-service GUIs for observability. So being, we have a self-service UI that's open source called Vector and clicking on menus and then bringing up some tracing reports that might be flame graphs that use BPF or whatever. I'm excited because I get to do some things that previously were impossible. One of them is conquering all performance issues. So if you told me that you have a CPU issue. I get really excited. CPU issues are easy to solve, e relatively easy to solve, in that I can run a profiler. I, if stack traces work, if they don't work, I go fix them. If symbols don't work, I go fix them. But once you get profiler output, at least you know the functions that are being called. Uh, that tells you most of the story, and then you can use a performance monitoring counter tool to look at the CPU cycles. So, CPU issues are great. What's really complicated is off-CPU issues. Every time we block because we're in a lock, 
we're waiting on networking, we're waiting on some other event. And all of these events, the way they get processed by the kernel, if I'm waiting, blocked on a lock, or sleep, doing an explicit sleep, or if I'm going on the run queue because there's too much CPU load, these are all kernel functions. And so we can instrument them and then get information out. So with one approach, I can take on any performance issue. Doesn't matter if it's CPU or off CPU, there is a way to do it. BPF tracing, to explain that in some more detail, I've written up a, a brief Linux tracing timeline. Static traces and prototype dynamic traces have existed since the 1990s. And dynamic tracing was first created at the University of Wisconsin, and they created a prototype tool that, that showed that it was pretty interesting and could work. Linux almost had it in the kernel first with the LTT and D probes effort, which was interesting, but unfortunately that never got integrated. A few years later, Sun started work on Dtrace and launched that in Solaris, which is not Linux. That was actually a really useful turning point for the technology as it proved how useful it could be. Dtrace was production safe, and Solaris was a kernel that was known for reliability. And since then, there's been much more effort on Linux to get dynamic tracing tools to maturity. Unfortunately, many of them were out of tree and they weren't integrated. So system tap was out of tree. Some of the system tap development was useful because things like uprobes did make it in tree. Ftrace does solve a lot of issues created by Steven Rustat. Uh, I still use that. Perf, great profiler, PMCs, trace points, and now only in the last two years, we've, we've had the BPF, enhanced BPF patches, which give, give us the extra capabilities so that we can do everything we want to do for observability. In the slides, which I'll post online, I've got the BPF enhancements by Linux version. So K probes, 4.1, an efficient way of passing data from kernel to user in 4.4, and then stack traces, trace points, and profiling. By the time we get to profiling, we can do basically everything we want to do. But of course, the really exciting bit is enhanced BPF is in Linux. This is not another third-party tracer, which is really interesting, but struggles to have adoption. With eBPF, if you're running Linux, sooner or later, you'll be on a kernel that has it. And so it will be a matter of downloading open source tools that use it or using an application that uses it. It won't be a matter of, please install my third-party tracer that does some kernel magic that, that might be dangerous or might not. So BPF, I'm expecting to get much, and I've seen already much better traction. It's the one that got integrated. eBPF is an enhanced Berkeley Packer filter. I've gone through that, many uses. It has a mascot, which is a ponycorn, which was uh, influenced from the Dtrace mascot, which is also a ponycorn. This one's a bit crazier because BPF is a bit crazier. This one's got wings as well. So I had a diagram like this before. With BPF, to go through it in a bit more detail, you generate your program in user space as BPF bytecode. That gets sent to the kernel. There is a strict verifier that will look for anything naughty in terms of security. And if it doesn't like it, it rejects it. If it passes the verifier, the BPF program can then run. And there are many different event sources we can use. And there's two different ways of passing for an observability tool to pass observability observability data back to user level. I may want per event output, using perf output, which does a binary transfer, or I may want to do statistics, which has a, what's called a BPF map, but it's really, in a, it's like an associative array. So key values that I can pass out. You can write raw BPF programs. And there are some examples in the kernel source. I don't because it's pretty crazy. It's really difficult. Uh, I'm not sure it's crazier than the example Katie had in the talk previously in this room of the JavaScript made up of just square brackets and parentheses. That was really crazy, but uh, this is quite difficult. I've tried writing raw BPF programs from scratch. It's the only language that's defeated me. I've not been able to get my programs to compile. I have authored Intercal, if you know what Intercal is. 
In fact, I'm a contributor to the Intercal repository. I wrote the guessing game example. So I've succeeded in Intercal, but I've failed at raw BPF. That's okay because we don't need to write raw BPF. There's lots of layers on top. So there's CBPF, so I can write it using a C syntax, which is actually C, and there are examples in the kernel. The programs still get pretty long. That was 58 lines. Then there's the open source BCC co compiler, or BPF compiler collection, the BCC project, which is from IOVisor in the Linux Foundation. And that has multiple front ends that makes things even easier. The main one we've been working on is Python, but there's also Lua, C++, there's C helper libraries, and there's a new project for Go BPF as well. So as an example of Python, the Python front end, now's the first time I can write a B BPF program entirely on one slide. It's made up of two parts. On the left is the kernel part, which is declaring a histogram, and that's an alias to do a k-probe of block account IO completion, and then we're incrementing a histogram based on a log two kilobytes. And then I've got the user level program that will We've declared it as BPF there, and then the user level program just fetches it and prints it out. So hooray, it fits. It fits on, fits on one slide. A useful tool. It can get a lot shorter than this, and languages like SystemTap and Dtrace showed how concise you can make a tracing language. There have been, there's a couple of efforts at least that are going on right now to do this. One of them's called Ply, and that's where the, the language looks like this. Right now, however, those projects are not at maturity. You can help out if, if that interests you. Right now, this is at maturity, so we are able to do the more longer form BCC BPF programs, and that's how we're getting things done at Netflix. But in the future, it might get a lot easier. Since I spend far too much of my life looking at performance tools, like tracing tools, I've summarized this diagram to show the scope and capability of the tool and then the ease of use. And so, BCC BPF has a lot of capabilities. It can do things that many previous tracing tools couldn't do, including dtrace, but we don't have the ease of use yet. But still, if your company really needs something, then it's great that you can do it at all, rather than worrying too much about it being easy. So at Netflix, I care most about being able to write that tool and solve that problem. Uh, Having it easy comes next. That'll be nice. In the slides, which I will post, I have summarized the state of BPF as of today. And basically everything we've, we really needed to get done is done. There are a couple of loose ends, and there are open issues on GitHub. I'll give you an overview on how to use BCC BPF, but it's going to depend on your environment. And for some of you, you may, may be doing an apt get install BCC or yum install BCC. But I think for a lot of people in the future, you, you'll be using this through a performance monitoring product. It may be one that you build internally or one that you get from a third party. So the important part, the important takeaway is what can be done so that you can ask whoever it is that builds that observability tool to provide it to you. So as some exposure to one way to use it, there's the BCC project for the command line tools. And we've now got that on repo.iovisor.org, so you can do, end up doing an apt get install. Uh, for Ubuntu Xenial, it helps if you're on the newest possible, because more tools will work. Oh, and we did do an Ubuntu, uh, an, an Ubuntu snap. I don't know if that's in the official repos yet, but we did get that to work. Something I've got in the slides I, I wanted to emphasize is I don't start with BCC tools. I start with the standard tools because they work, they're using kernel bean counters, they're free, and then I go and use the, the more advanced tools if I need to. F-trace tools, I've done them in the past before, and some of them can be a little bit cheaper to run than BCC, so I'm still using some of them. But the BCC tools are now filling in gaps that we couldn't do previously. So I've been decorating my uh, kernel diagram with where the tools instrument. I have got a BCC general performance checklist online of tools you can run through if you never had a starting point before. So 
you may already have a starting point. You may already suspect a file system issue or a disk issue or a TCP issue and reach for those tools. But here's an example of getting value out of BCC and BPF when you don't have that starting point. Working through these tools and seeing what stands out. That's just working through lots of different angles. I have some screenshots, but screenshots in the slides, but I already did some demos of XXSnoop and OpenSnoop, my favorites. Uh, there's also cache stat for doing the file system cache statistics, TCP tools to see just who am I connecting to without the overhead of tracing send receive, it's just doing the connect, the same for accept and retransmits. Get host latency is another interesting tool which instruments the resolver library. And then I've got some scheduler tools that go into things like run queue latency. And the latest tools, and this is what made it into 4.9, Linux 4.9 is time sampling. In Linux 4.9, we had not just time sampling, but also access to the performance monitoring counters. So now I can write tools that use, that might do every 10,000 LLC misses, get a stack trace, or instrument something. There are other ones, though many of those are single purpose tools. Uh, there are some multi tools like Funk Count, Arg, and Sasha's Arg Dist and Trace. And I did some demonstrations of them. So things like Trace, they let you do quite a lot. So the idea of Trace is let's have some, some of the common things that you want to do expressible as a one liner. And I was demonstrating some of that earlier. So it's sysread if the requested bytes was over 20,000 print out a string. And in the help message of trace, there are a bunch of one-liners. ArgDist is something similar for argument examination. Visualizations I've talked about, because I think that's actually where most of us will use these tools. It's not just latency heat maps. There's also visualization. There's also the flame graph visualization. Has anyone used flame graphs? Hooray. So now I have half the room. So I created flame graphs a number of years ago because I had a problem of too many stack traces to comprehend. And they've been used a lot for CPU performance analysis, but now with BPF we're using them for off CPU performance analysis because it becomes cheaper to instrument the scheduler events when threads block and measure the time they're blocked because we can summarize that in kernel. One of the tools I wrote was the off-wake flame graphs. So it shows the blocked stack trace, and then on top I paste the stack trace of who woke the, that up. Because sometimes when you look at the blocked stack trace, you see, well, I'm waiting on some, someone else. I'm waiting on some other event. I'm doing ePoll, or I'm doing Futex wait. And you need to know the other stack that woke you up to make sense of it. Uh, one thing I was doing on the flight over here from the US was extending this into chain graphs using the real support we've now got so that I can paste together all the wake-up stacks. So if you have multiple wake-up stacks, so thread A woke up thread B, woke up thread C, then woke up our target, I paste them all together. So you can see the full history of wake-ups. To give you some exposure on how to program BCC and BPF, you do want to be on the latest kernel. Here I've decorated it with where these technologies were integrated with BPF. So PMCs were the last, Linux 4.9. It liberates you so that you can decide what tools you want. All of this power. So start with the questions you want the system to answer, and then find the answers. Instead of the previous methodology where the vendor gives you a tool, and then you try and interpret it. I love functional diagrams. You can step through them and, and think, how could I have a tool that looked at the target I.O. driver's latency or errors? Just as one example in the slides, ByTest summarizes disk I.O. size. That's the code. So I've got some kernel code that will create the, the histogram, and then I've got the Python code to print it out. This is similar to what I've shown before, so it goes to the verifier, and we're using a map to do the summary. And I've annotated it here. So we have a BPF histogram, which is our map, there's our C program. That's the event we're instrumenting. And then a Python program to print it out. I actually don't think many people are going to write this stuff. If you do, that's great. But what's more important is that you know that this is possible so that you can ask the person 
the person who wants to write this stuff to write this stuff for you so that everyone can then use it. At Netflix, we have something like 2,000 engineers. They're not all going to write BPF. Maybe a dozen of us will, but many other engineers will use it. And that's how I think it's going to practically be used. There are some current complications, but it's getting better over time. And in the slides, I have some references for tutorials. If you do want to use it, uh, that would be great. And of course, there is a Lua front end if that's your thing. So in summary, BPF tracing in Linux, we've been adding the capabilities to BPF, and 4.9 has them all. We have lots of tools we can now use, and some interesting future work, and we welcome contributions. Right now, I actually think the biggest difficulty we have is not the engineering work, it's the marketing, it's the community, it's communication. And so having people be aware that it exists and can use it is something we need contributions and we need help with. And that's my talk. Now, I'd love to hear questions, and it's, you can make use of us being at a, a conference face-to-face -face by asking me anything about this. And if we run out of time, of course, you can ask me at the conference. Hi. Um, obvious question from a FreeBSD user. We have DTrace. Would EPF, eBPF be better, worse, or the same? So uh, basically, should we, should we put effort into porting eBPF over to FreeBSD? Okay, I won't repeat the question because you're mic'd, which is good. So DTrace is very similar to eBPF in terms of capabilities. And of Ford, Linux 4.9, it, it caught up. And I'm really excited because DTrace is an awesome tool and I've used it a lot to do countless performance work. And switching to Linux, which I did when I went to Netflix, it felt like I'd lost my superpower. And so I've been working hard to bring it back. Would it be interesting to port eBPF over to FreeBSD? There are some things that can definitely improve DTrace. So the chain graphs, for example, require the capability to save a stack in memory and then refer to that somewhere else and then to stitch together stacks. And so having like the waker stack stitched together with the sleeper stack, that's great, that's really awesome. DTrace can't do that. But then it's something that DTrace could be enhanced. So I think, uh, it might be really interesting to see DTrace move forward because Linux is now exploring and innovating and trying new things. Like Facebook is using BPF as well, Netflix is using BPF, GitHub is using BPF. Lots of companies are getting on board and we'll try out things that people haven't thought of before and that can encourage DTrace enhancements. So DTrace hopefully will end up being better because we're discovering things are useful and that can be ported over. Another question. Uh, so one of the things that DTrace prides itself on is that it's very stable, and in particular, um, for example, it's not Turing complete, and dereferencing stuff doesn't really work all the time. So is BPF in the same class? Like, is it Turing complete and that sort of thing? So one of the nice things about DTrace is the language was finished, and so you could and it also had a lot of attention on stability of arguments and, and the way you use trace points or the way you use probes. At the moment, BPF is still having some things added to it because of different use cases, but in terms of observability, it has everything we need. The BCC language is vastly under, develop, uh, under development, and so that's, that's still changing. We're gonna see more macros. So, at some point in the future, the dust will have settled and the BCC language will stop moving and uh, it will have similar stability as, as DTrace, but we're not there yet. So at the moment, if I write a BCC tool now, it might break in six months and I have to fix it. The dust has been settling, so things have not been breaking so much, but we're just not there yet. Yes? Um, I just note that you didn't mention SecComp as far as one of the users of BPF. Oh yeah, SecComp uses, I should have had that, SecComp uses BPF as well, and uh, they can use eBPF to do much more cool things for security policy enforcement. So, cool, thanks. Yes. So what's the current impact? Like, I mean, this days uh, compared to uh, dynamic and static tracing, what's the actual performance impact on the system? 
So what's the platform uh, for? Uh, performance impact uh, of the dynamic and static tracing. The performance impact for dynamic and static tracing. As, a, as an engineer, I have a gut feeling of, of what I'm tracing. And you have to multiply the frequency of the event with the costs of the event. So generally, if it's less than 1,000 a second, I don't care about it. It's going to be negligible. I start to worry when the frequency of the event is more than 100,000 or a million a second, because it's going to start to be measurable. Uh, if it's more than 10 million a second, it's, it could actually start to hurt, because I'm adding CPU cycles to every event. And then it's the cost of the event. If I'm doing string things, it costs a bit more. If I'm doing user level tracing, it costs a lot more because of the current implementation. But at Linux Plumbers Conference, it was discussed to fix the or improve the user level implementation to make that much faster. But for a lot of things, it's, you just have to think about the frequency. So disk I.O., it's not going to be a problem. Schedule events, depends how busy the server is. 10 gig networking, it's pretty fast. But eBPF has been designed to handle it. But you can certainly find something that will break it because the frequency is too high. And an example would be, let's instrument malloc, like libc malloc. Well, that actually can get called like 10 million times a second. It can get called a lot. And that can actually be too painful. Oh, that is all we have time for. Thank you, Brandon. Thank you.